On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about some ways that we identify and treat early stage adhesive capsulitis. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Uh, we are here socially distancing again. Most of us from home looks like Dave is by the loading dock at Champion PT and Performance up in Boston. I'm here with Dave Tilly, Lenny McCrina, Mike Scaduto. You guys ever watch the videos to see if this syncs up when I do that? Yes and no, it doesn't. Because it's like different <laughs> on your computers too. Right? So like, is that Dave? No. This is the Mike. Mike, <laughs> Lenny. You know. Dave, just, Mike, yeah, Lenny. It makes sense. It's different on everybody's computer. But anyway, we are here answering a uh, um, uh, more of our reader or listener or both or watcher <coughs> questions as usual. Um, we got a great one today from Cecilia from Brazil. Um, I thought this was a good question. I, and and I, I sent it to you guys a little bit earlier. I hope you guys kind of took a peek at it so you could you know think about it. But Cecilia asks, I want to read it well, um, if diagnosed early enough, can adhesive capsulitis be treated so that way the actual encapsulation process does not develop. And you know what, why don't we approach this question as this, like if we get, if we catch early adhesive capsulitis, like in a, you know, irritable or even a freezing phase, if we want to use like the less um, scientific terminology, can we prevent them from getting further off, like frozen in that process? So who wants to start? I mean, I mean, I'm sure we all have some experience with this. Maybe Len, you can talk about some people that you've, you've seen, you know, that maybe you think you've yeah. helped, but like, yeah. why, don't you, why don't you start off Len with your experience and then Dave and Mike like chime in when, you know, as you, as you get some ideas. Yeah, the, no doubt. I've treated a bunch of people with this. And a lot of times when they come to me, it's, well, you got, I, I think of it two different ways. They come to me and it's way too late and they are way beyond this because they thought it was just a, a rotator cuff or they just thought they had shoulder pain or rotator cuff tendonitis. And they come to me and it's like, they just can't raise their shoulder up. I think that's more in the freeze, the deep into the freezing or frozen phase. But I, I get a lot of people that come in that are in that kind of early phase. And I think if you can recognize it early, meaning they're having like this pain that without a specific onset, uh, a very benign kind of reaching, kind of reaching back. I hear a lot pulling luggage, reaching into my back seat. My shoulder started to ache. It's been a few weeks. It's throbbing now. And I'm beginning to like, it's beginning to, I have good motion, but it just doesn't feel right. And it's not that true rotator cuff pain that you get down. One thing, uh, one kind of another clue that I get from people, and I think I got this from Kevin Wilk in Birmingham, is that they have this horizontal pain, this band of pain that goes along their shoulder, that tends to be more synovitis, which we think is kind of the precursor to frozen shoulder versus the pain coming down, which is rotator cuff. Not the pain going all the way down, that's going to be more neck, but the pain coming down, rotator cuff, horizontal band, more um, synovitis. So for those people, I'll go cortisone injection. I'll try to get them in to see a doctor and get a cortisone injection. So that's where a relationship with a doctor is critical because they need to trust your judgment and try to recommend, hopefully, that the patient can get one because I think that'll help them in the long run to avoid, I think, the full-blown. I think I've definitely seen people where I've gotten them a cortisone shot early and we were able to manage their symptoms, manage their loss of motion. They still got a little loss of motion, but not the full-blown months and months and months of, you know, that freezing, frozen, thawing phase. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that, that we were able to recognize it earlier. Could be biased. You know, like maybe I want to pat myself on the back, but I, I don't know. I'm pretty convinced that their symptoms really matched what was going to be a bad episode or could have been a bad episode. And we were able to help it with early cortisone. And research has shown that early cortisone is definitely beneficial to people. 
you know, it's, it's interesting. Like it's, um, it's a biased question a little bit, right? Because if you, if you address it early enough, you never really know if it was adhesive capsulitis, right? I know, I know exactly. You, know, you yeah. only, you only know until it's, it's too late. So, um, I thought that was pretty cool though. A good way to differentiate, um, some differences in whether or not it's rotator cuff. Like Lenny said, rotator cuff kind of like radiates down almost. Whereas the other one, I just fit, sometimes they, you know, they almost do this, like the, you yeah. know, what do we say about the hip, you know, like yeah. they almost kind of grab that. I, yeah. I, it's almost like more jointy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Versus like rotator cuffy. Um, yeah. you, you brought up a good point though. You brought up somebody that like, you, you know, reaching in the back seat, stuff like that. Like, um, sometimes it, it takes like an incident and then it trips like this cascade of inflammation yeah. that they can't get out of. And right. I don't think we completely understand that, but you, you just brought up a really good example. So, so that person would almost look like a rotator cuff impingement type person because they strain their rotator cuff or whatever, right. like yeah. picking, picking up something. Um, and then that could turn into it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think you kind of alluded to this too. Sometimes people just come in and they just have some goofy pain and we're not hundred percent sure why. And it right. doesn't add up to impingement signs either. Yeah. Right. And you're like, man, I don't know. You're too young. I don't know why you, you know, you, you know, right. you, you don't have OA, you know, you don't have osteoarthritis, but. And I think another thing is in medical history too, make sure you uh, tease out a couple, you know, do they have diabetes, they have thyroid issues. Those two have been linked to um, higher incidence of uh, frozen shoulder as well. So maybe their medical history could give you a clue along with their symptoms and maybe an onset. So those are my kind of go-to questions. What about you, uh, Dave, Mike, anything you guys want to add? Yeah, my two cents, I think Lenny hit it really well is, um, I mean, often these things are multifactorial and I think we get kind of you know, stuck in the research of looking at the shoulder capsule itself. And I think as Lenny pointed out, there's a lot of issues that could possibly mitigate the, the long-term, you know, progression of it. But at the same time, I think we don't really know a lot about exactly what's going on and exactly the time course that people have. So I think to some degree, you may be able to reduce the, the intensity or severity of that onset. But I think a lot of times these people have a lot of other low hanging fruit that we can help them with that they don't realize is linked to maybe why they have shoulder issues. So looking at thoracic spine motion, looking at neck motion, looking at soft tissue stuff, you're not going to maybe prevent the capsule itself from becoming really like, you know, irritable, but if you can give that person 10% motion from their upper back and from their soft tissue. That's probably going to be a big deal for them because they can move a little bit more with less pain. So I think we often look at the pathology and I'm guilty of this when I was a kind of a newer clinician and just hyper focusing on the capsule, but there's a lot of other things that we can do for these people, I think in the short term to help them. And I think it's not only about, you know, looking at the capsule, but many other things as well. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't know, you know, we don't know a lot about this. We don't know like who turns into this and who doesn't. Right. And a lot of times it's chicken or the egg. And I think that, you know, you kind of like kind of alluded to that Dave, a little bit of where it's chicken or the egg a little bit, like where is it the capsule that is getting a little tight and irritable for whatever reason, maybe something, you know, uh, systemic that we don't understand, right. Like linked to their diabetes or something like that, but it, maybe it's the capsule getting irritated and then they're causing a little bit more impingement and it's causing a little bit more, you know, pain. And then you start to get that cascade or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you get a traumatic incident or you get some rotator cuff impingement. And then for whatever reason, the capsule becomes inflamed, right? Like, cause we see this, we see this both, right? We see the idiopathic and then we see like the post injury type adhesive capsulitis. They, they both seem to happen. So, um, you know, that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Mike, any, anything on your end? Well, I think from a treatment perspective, if someone's presenting with uh, loss of motion, that could be painful, especially into external rotation. Uh, I'm going to make that a focus of my treatment, especially early on. So we're going to do a lot of active assisted range of motion, some soft tissue, maybe some joint mobs. Um, and that's going to be kind of like our monitor of progress is how well are they maintaining motion? Are, you, are they losing motion? If so, maybe we re- um, reassess where we're at. Maybe then we're, we're sending off to a doctor to get a cortisone injection if we haven't done that already. Um, but definitely want to try to maintain and gain motion, uh, especially into external rotation, which seems to be you know, the capsular pattern for something like adhesive capsulitis. And then probably just not with the, with joint mobs. Um, I, I tend to go not super aggressive with my joint mobs. I guess there'd be grade four joint mobs, but maybe I'm not uh, doing you know, a, a lot of them, uh, the thought in my mind is we don't want to stimulate that, um, that inflammation or that inflammatory process, but it, we want to do it until we get a little bit of motion and then have them, uh, passively ma move their shoulder or, you know, active assisted range of motion kind of from there to maintain motion. 
I like it. So, you know, if we, if we kind of put it all together, I mean, I think, you know, we talked a lot about like what's going on or, you know, as much as we know what's going on, um, which is pretty good. So it sounds like maybe an early quarter zone is pretty helpful, which is, which is great. You know, I mean, I'm on board with that and I think that helps quite a bit. Um, but otherwise I think, it, you know, the concept of this is like, you know, you get an irritable shoulder that maybe has a little bit of loss of motion. It's about getting, getting after that a little bit, early right and and i think if you take some of what mike said there we focus more on the frequency of the mobility because again maybe maybe self immobilization is part of why they got into this mess right because they said oh it kind of hurts so i'm going to just not use my arm for a few weeks you know what i mean and maybe that kind of got into it so it's a lot of frequent motion um so yeah so I guess to summarize for Cecilia, like, you know, you know, how do we treat it? Well, I think we treat it just like anything else, but I think the, the number one key to treatment is identifying that this may be what's happening. And I think I would just add this to the discussion here is that I think a lot of times what we think is impingement or like even like early rotator cuff, like issues, you know, inflammation type things may in fact be early adhesive capsulitis that if we address right away, I think we save them from going down that road. I think it happens almost, almost every day in your clinic, I bet it's, and you don't even know it's happening. That's my guess. I mean, just because I've seen people non-compliant or people not take care of themselves, like spiral down out of control and you can't stop that. So I, I actually think we're doing more, more uh, 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 helpful things to them by trying to get them to break that cycle before the cycle even begins. So I think that's, that's kind of the key. So Cecilia, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's, there's some things we can do. Now you talk about before the actual, you know, encapsulation. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, that's like late phase, like type of heath capsulitis. I think just even focusing on earlier, if you just, you got to notice, Hey, somebody's got just a loss of like 10% of their very end range or range of motion. That's weird right? That's weird. And it's, you know, make sure, make sure they can get that motion back and make sure they're frequently moving it. So um, we can do a ton of good for these types of patients if we uh, are thinking that way, right? Because if you're thinking rotator cuff impingement and that's it, you might not focus on assuring that the capsule stays mobile and the range of motion stays mobile. You just might focus on strength, for example. So, so kind of keep that in mind as well. Anytime you see an irritable shoulder, we'll call it that. I want you to think that going forward, that this may be like a phase one freezing kind of adhesive capsulitis. It might even be pre-freezing. I just made up a new stage. That's a thing. That's the thing. Pre-freezing. What, what would pre-freezing be? It would be wet. It's wet. It's the wet <laughs> phase. <laughs> All right. Not, not funny. Okay. It's early. It's early. We're, do, we're, we're doing this early in the day, but anyway, awesome. Well, great question, Cecilia. We appreciate it. Thanks for, for listening and watching from Brazil. That's awesome. If you have a question like that, head to MikeRinald.com and click on the podcast link and you can fill out the form to keep asking us some amazing questions. So keep them coming. Anything you can do to help support the show, we'd appreciate it. Head to iTunes, Spotify, rate and review, and we will see you on the next episode.